Um, so yeah, we'll go a bit more in detail. I will not cover all the behavior of the scheduler because it's a bit too much for an hour. Um, but uh, yeah, my goal is that you understand a bit more why your task has uh, the um, um, my goal is that you can explain a bit more why, what, why your task is scheduled in one way or another way by the scheduler. And also to maybe to optimize your, your usage of kernel thread and user space task. So this is the introduction. Um, so the session on Tuesday is a really good way to start understanding the scheduler that give you an history, that give you all the background needed to, to, to work on the scheduler. So I have just put back the different scheduling class. So this stop deadline, RT, CFS, and IDLE. Having in mind that we mainly use deadline, RT, and CFS, which are the three scheduling, real scheduling tasks. The IDLE is just there when you, have any, you don't have anything to um, schedule and you want to put your CPU in an idle state. And stop is there to um, <coughs> replace any running task. So when you want to unplug a CPU, this task will be run. So you will be sure that no other task will run on the CPU and you can do whatever you want. Or if you want to migrate a task, we can only migrate a task that is not running on a CPU, but waiting. So if you want to migrate the current running task, usually what we call some active migration. So we force to schedule the stop task, which will preempt the current running task. And because it's now a waiting task, you can mi migrate that to another CPU. Um, I will focus on the CFS, completely fair scheduler. Um, so fi 55 minutes, yes, it's quite short to go in, de in all the detail of the scheduler. So I will only look at some part and maybe in a, in a, during another connect, I will cover other part of the scheduler. So in order to understand the scheduling in the kernel, you have to understand how the topology of your system is, is described and how it's used. So we'll start with that, with the description of the CPU topology in uh, the scheduler. Then I will cover all the metrics that are used in the scheduler describe what they are meaning and how, what we can extract from that. I will cover this C group, control group, because that add another level of complexity in the way the scheduler is behaving. So it's quite imp important to understand that. And I will finish with the task placement. When a task, when we are selecting a CPU, on which CPU a task will, will run, how we are ensuring that the tasks are well balanced between all the CPU. So the topology. <coughs> uh, so in the scheduler, we are describing the, what we call the CPU topology. And this CPU topology, for describing that, we are following the memory layout and the cache layout. The goal is to describe which CPU, so in fact, there is another level. So which CPU are sharing some compute capacity? Sorry, <coughs> some compute capacity. And uh, for example, when you have some hyper-threading, which CPU are sharing the same cache? So you can easily migrate tasks between this CPU without losing too much cache effect. Which CPU are in the same socket or same die? And then you can add some more level for if you have some NUMA system that will describe the distance between each node. <coughs> so this are the four, uh, so yeah. So that's what we call, so a scale domain, it's a level of this, it's a level where we will describe the relation between group of CPU. And the scale group, it's a group of, uh, it's a group of CPU, and we are just comparing this group of CPU between each other. We are, but we, yeah, we never really sp uh, spoke about CPU by itself, but it's only scale group and group of CPU. Now, a group of CPU can be made of only one CPU. But usually, 
what we are start starting with. <coughs> so these are the four main flags that can be used, this, that are used in the skate domain to describe the dependency between the group. So the first one, it's used for um, asymmetric system like Big Little. So the SD asym CPU capacity. So when this flag is set in a skate domain level, it means that between the groups at this level, we can have different compute capacity. So we can have some big core and we can have some little core, but not in the same group, between the group. <coughs> so share CPU capacity. So this, this is for SMT system, so hyper-threading. It's just to, s to explain that these two CP this CPU in this group will share some compute capacity, some ALU, some uh, whatever. So you will have to share the amount of, uh, yeah, how much um, computation can be done. <coughs> yeah. Based on what? The first flag, uh, ASIM uh, CPU. The, the first flag, uh, ASIM it's CPU capacity. And based on what the, 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 the uh, scheduler knows it's, if we, it, we is it automatic? Yeah, so, yeah. So, because we have per CPU compute capacity value, we know, so we have a, a range from one, uh, from zero to uh, 1024 for the compute capacity of each CPU. And you can request the compute capacity of each CPU. So when we are building this kit domain, we are also asking for the compute capacity of each CPU. And if in one, in one level we see some different compute capacity, it means that we have some asymmetric system, the big little. We have reached the big little level, where big and, and Little will be available at the same level. So for a big little system, uh, the it will be set only for the scheduling domain which has both big and little CPUs and not yeah. for the others, right? Yeah. So the share, p uh, share power domain, that's something we have added a few years ago, but it's not that much used. The goal was to mention um, <coughs> where, um, when you have some group of CPU that, that were sharing the same power domain. The goal was mainly to say it doesn't work to, pull, to try to idle a CPU because he, sh he shared the same power domain as another one, so you will not be able to save any significant amount of power. And the last one, share package resources, it's mainly when you are sharing the, your cache uh, and your access to the memory. And share CPU capacity is only for SMT? Yeah. Um, just, yeah. So this is typical. Uh, this is a typical scheduler topology. So in orange you have the skate domain, and in in green you have so the skate group. So when you start at the highest level, so the SMT. So when you have some hyperthreading, so two CPU on the same core. So you can see that at that domain. So for this domain. We, can, we are seeing only CPU 0 and CPU 1. So when you are uh, the CPU 0, you will have this level, but you will not see that. It means that at the first level, you will only see that there is CPU 1 with you that share the compute capacity. And then when you will go down one more level, which is MC for multi-core, you will see, so um, you will have this group made of 0 and 1, saying that we are in the same group coming from the SMT level. And there is other group with which we are sharing. So in this case, it's the package resources, so the cache level. But you will not see the other cluster. So it's really you are scaling. The goal is to go step by step from the closer CPU to the older system. And the die, so we are calling that the die. That can also be the socket on Intel. And you will see all the group. And then you will have the NUMA. And that's all. And uh, you, can, you can add how many level you want for the NUMA node, for example. And it's the same if you are the CPU 6 at the, I would say, highest level or close, uh, smallest level. You will only see the CPU, uh, CPU 7 that share the compute capacity. It's only when you are going down that you will discover the other one. Um, yeah. So there is a default um, 
uh, topology uh, description in the scheduler. This can be superseded by, um, by an architecture. I mean, if you want something, for example, I don't remember which, which um, architecture is it, but some have a book level there, which is uh, another level of uh, concatenation of CPU. So you can uh, overwrite the default topology what you own, and you can describe for each level, uh, so you can add the number of levels that you want, and you can provide a different uh, description and flag for each level. So you just have to provide the CPU mass, so which CPU are with you at this level, the flag and the name, that's all. And so um, <clears throat> all the level are built by default, so we are going through all the level, which means that if the support of hyperthreading is enabled also, uh, for an ARM system, you will build the SMT level. Then the MC, the die, the NUMA level are added afterward. So it's not um, added, but um, by default, you're, you're building all the level. <clears throat> and this um, sketch domain and topology is rebuilt, can be rebuilt at runtime. For example, when the capacity of a CPU is, is changing, that not happen that much, but because the capacity of the CPU has changed. By capacity, I, we mean the maximum capacity. It's not linked to frequency scaling because that would happen too much, too often. But uh, it's really when, for one or good reason, your CPU suddenly can have much more capacity, sustainable capacity or far less, you can re rebuild your system, your topology, because you can create some different kind of CPU topology. Also, when you are outplugging some CPU, because one CPU is no more there, you are rebuilding the topology level. And also when you are using control group and you are using the partitioning to create some uh, isolated uh, group of CPU. In this case, we are rebuilding to make the other CPU not visible. So, <clears throat> because, yeah. So no, when you say for capacity update, the topology yeah. can get rebuilt, you yeah. mean the max capacity? Yeah. Okay. Only the max. Okay. And it has to be that the max capacity is remaining at that level for a certain amount of time? Is yeah. that a constraint yeah, like to, that? To be honest, I, I don't have any use case in mind for now. Unless it comes from the user side. Because then yeah. you can be sure that it yeah. remains at that level for yeah. some time. Okay. But, um, I think that for ARM system, we don't have such use case. Yeah, yeah. So we are building all that level, but if you look, for example, for an ARM system, at SMT level, we'll have only one CPU and one group per sketch domain, which means that uh, you typically can't do anything. You can't migrate some tasks because you are alone. So it's just useless to keep this level. So after having built all the um, level, we are removing the useless level. And useless level are, gro are sketch domain when, where you have only one CPU, because there is nothing, or one group of CPU, because there is nothing that you can do at that level. There is no possible migration. <clears throat> so um, also, you can have some case where between two levels, you don't have more CPU. And in this case, uh, the load balance should have happened at the previous level, so you can just remove that. Also, if there is no useful uh, information compared to the child. I mean, uh, so that is just because, so yeah, that, uh, that happens from time to time when you have too much level. So for example, for the ARM system, the SMT level will have only one CPU at the beginning, so it's just useless. At the MC level, usually we have four CPU, so one group for each. And then at the die level, if we take typical uh, mobile uh, phone, <coughs> we will have two clusters, two groups, which um, represent the two clusters, the big and the little. So, um, so yeah, that's the typical scheduling topology for a big little system, where we can see that at this level, so these two, this little core are sharing 
their cache, this big core sharing their cache, and then we have the, the coherency point of the system. But on dynamic, because you can have all the eight CPU sharing the same cache, in this case, the die level is, is no more useful because you will have only one group. So you have only one scheduling level by default. <clears throat> so the LLC, so that's something we are using quite a lot. That's the last level of cache. That's where, that, that give you up to which level you can make some um, cheap task migration in, uh, in terms of a computation impact. So in this case, the last level of cache is not the same between dynamic system and big little, legacy big little system, which means that some migration, because we can do fast migration when we are, um, when we are sharing some cache, for example, typically uh, the m one main difference there is that because big and little are sharing cache, when the task wake up on dynamic, we are able to directly migrate some task between big and little, whereas normally, so we have the EES patch set that can make a difference. But in the default behavior of the scheduler, you can't do some migration at wake up. You will have to wait um, a migration, uh, you will have to wait for a normal load balance before migrating. That can add some uh, scheduling latency and performance impact. <clears throat> so, when you put skate debug in, the, in your command line, you have uh, some additional debug uh, logs that are put in your, in your console. I have just put, uh, taken a few, so you can see all the skate domain, and for each skate domain, the group and which CPU belong to each group, so the MC and the die, so that's for the IK960. And you have also some uh, capacity information, so that's the capacity of the group, so you can see there that, for, so the CPU tree is a little core, so you have a capacity of less than uh, 512, and the CPU 4, it's a big core, and we are almost at the max value, which is 1024. We are using 1024 just because it's 10 bit, it's quite easy to, to multiply and divide by. Uh, just one thing that is interesting to notice is that uh, normally, here we should have only 1024, which is the max capacity on the system, and that's the big core. And they should all have the same value and the same area for the little. But in fact, in this debug log, we are not reflecting the max capa capacity, but the current capacity. And the current capacity that is available for CFS task. So that's why it just means that there, instead, we are not at the maximum because some computing capacity has been uh, used either by interrupt or by RT task or by deadline. So it just, or because we are, no, we are, it's not taken into account the, the frequency. But it's just what is remaining for the CFS task, which are the main tasks in the scheduler. So don't hesitate to ask or to interrupt. No, it's, uh, it's clearly the value when the log have been printed. So if you force that to be regenerated a bit later, the value will be different. Oh, it's just that uh, <coughs> we are starting with the first CPU. So uh, because we are CPU three, so oh, yeah. So yeah, we are starting with the local CPU. And then we have a round robin. Yeah. So it, it is related. So if in the code, you have, only, you have only one instance for every domain. Whereas for a group, you have separate instances on a per CPU basis. Is there a? No, we have, it's only, uh, so that's. Or is the, it the other way around? Yeah, that's always per, per CPU. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The groups are per CPU. No, no the, uh, the, the, domain domain per yeah. Yeah, the domains are per CPU. Yeah. So is there a reason for that to be? Yes, it's for scalability. Um, so there. For performance yeah. So because the scheduler is used quite often in the system and 
that can be called, uh, I mean, that just depends how long a task want to run. And because we can have uh, up to 1,000, 10,000 of core, you must take care of the scalability of your algorithm. So that's why um, if we had, for example, only one, if, if we come back there, <coughs> for example, for this level, if we have only one SCAD domain structure for all the CPU, so for this one, that might be okay. But when you reach the die or the NUMA level, when you have 1,000 core that want to access the same structure at the same time, that creates a lot of contention. That creates a lot of cash um, exchange between CPU, and that slows down your performance. So that's why. We have one SCAD domain structure per CPU, so it's duplicated. And normally it's only static information, so that's not a problem. It's mainly read, but that prevents uh, all the CPU fighting to get the, 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 the line in their cache. So doesn't that same problem exist with shared groups as well? Yes, except that the value in SCAD group are used quite less often compared to the SCAD domain. It's just a trade-off between how often I'm using it and which kind of information. In the SCAD group, you have some information that are written. So um, you, this will be uh, updated regularly, like the capacity or the load in the group. So um, if you are doing one SCAD group per CPU, it means that you will have to, to update that for each CPU. The SCAD domain is almost, if not never, updated. I mean that just because there is a main event that forces you to update it. <clears throat> so yeah, the scale group, it shares some value that are modified at return it because we don't want to write 10,000 of times the same value. In this case, we prefer to share. <clears throat> and then, so we have this scale domain uh, topology. And then um, <clears throat> the scheduler um, saves some uh, direct pointer to some level in the topology, which are quite interesting. So we have the last level of cache, the LLC, which is used a lot because it's considered that that doesn't co co cost that much to migrate task up to this level. We have also the asymmetric CPU level, which is used by e um, ES, that just gives you at which level you have big and little. And um, if you look at this there, the last level of cache will not be at the same so it will be at the same level, but we will not have the same CPU available. But the last level of cache will be at MC level. But in, in one case, we will have a pointer there for B, uh, CPU B4, B5, 6, and 7. We will point to this. For the little, we will point to this. So we will have ac only access to four CPU. Whereas for the other one, it will be the same. We will have access to the eight CPU. So yeah, that's, uh, that's really an important. This topology and how it's built just define how the scheduler will, will work and how the load balance will work. So yeah, that's an important thing to have in mind. Do you have any question regarding this topology before moving to metrics? Uh, <coughs> the last uh, slide you had. So when you say the scheduler caches this value, how does it, like it caches permanently? Do you use a cache lock feature or something? Sorry? So you say that the scheduler caches some sensitive data. So what do you mean by caches? The yeah, I know it's just that uh, you have a, a pointer. So you have a per oh. CPU pointer that will point directly to this SCAD domain level. Okay, but not that the data is always cached. No, 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 yeah, okay. yeah. By, yeah, you just, uh, Instead of going through the SCAD domain to, f to, the, to the full topology to find this level, you directly have a pointer to this. So then the metric. So <clears throat> we have several metrics. We have three main metrics, I would say, in the scheduler that they use to, um, to decide which task to, pl to place on which CPU and how long, when should we the schedule a task and schedule another one. And this is also used, this metric or use, yes, for adjusting the CPU performance, mainly scaling its frequency. 
and yes, yeah, select the best CPU for a thread, where the, what we call the task placement. So the main trick is the V runtime, virtual running time. This is only used for the CFS. Uh, I will go more deeply on that uh, just after. The CPU capacity, that just give you an idea of the compute capacity. Relatively, it's, uh, just uh, we have a range of uh, yes, 10,000, 10, 24, and uh, just give you some relative compute capacity. And we have the PELT, which is the per entity load tracking. So for each, so by entity, it can be a CPU or a task or a group of tasks. We are monitoring some metric, some like the level of utilization, what we call the load, the renewable load. I will come back on that a bit later. <clears throat> so the VRUN time, virtual runtime of CFS. So it just, uh, the VRUN time, it V for virtual, just because we are wait, we, we add a weight on top of the running time of the task. And the goal is that to, to modify the way your running time will uh, increase according to the priority of the task. So we have the default value, the nice value zero, where the VRUN time is equal to the real running time. And then where, when your niceness is decreasing, you will, your VRUN time will increase slower, which means that from a scheduler point of view, even if you are running the same amount of time, we will consider that you, you, you got less running time. So we will provide you more real time to, to compensate your, your, the fact that your VRUN time is, run, is increasing slow, uh, slowly. And at the opposite, if your nice priority is higher, your VRUN time will increase faster, so you will have less running time at the end. <clears throat> so yeah, that's what I'm saying. So here, here just an example, I, I have just put two tasks. I don't remember the difference of the priority, but you can see that one task has far more running time or scheduling uh, period than the other one. That's typically the niceness of your task that will give this, uh, this ratio. So yeah, so the priority, the nice priority is used to uh, compute a weight that will be applied on your VRUN time. And normally the goal is that when you are increasing by one your priority, or you are decreasing by one your priority, you should have 10% of more running time compared to another CPU with a, another task with a priority one value below, uh, above. Yeah, it's just inverted. <clears throat> and so we have uh, some pre-computed value. I mean, we are not doing the computation at right time. We have some pre-computed, so we have the normal value and the uh, inverse multiply value to, to prevent any division and to make that faster. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we have 10%. This is just because uh, if you look, so we have this pre-computed table, and if you look at the value and you, you make the ratio between the weight of a nice uh, task with a nice priority zero compared to a nice priority one, you don't have 10% of difference, but 125. It's just that the explanation is there. It's just that um, if you want your task to have 10% more run time, so it means that you will have 55% of the time, and the other one will have 45, and that just gives you um, <coughs> this ratio, in fact. That's the reason why it's 125. So in fact, when you look at the value, it's not exactly 25. It's more around 123. But it's just because of the rounding. The goal is to have a, a, um, a consistent deviation across all the, the, um, the priority. Otherwise, if you strictly try to follow this, you will have, when you will have some low value, you will start to deviate quite a lot. So that's why. But that, that the, main, the main reason for that. Yeah? So the, if the weight is more, then the weight and time should decrease slowly, right? The weight is the priority. So shouldn't it be nice minus one? No, yeah, maybe I have, yeah. Maybe this, I uh, should, uh, yeah. Maybe minus I have make, uh, yeah, it's minus one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, it's a mistake. No, it's the weight. 
which means that because you are increasing your real runtime based on this weight, and we are comparing the the weight, the real runtime. Is so this one minute input has nothing to do with the capacity? No. Okay. Nothing at all. Okay. It's just that if your mice is zero, your weight is one zero two four. Yes. It, we, are, we are always trying to to um, to be a multiple of two, a power of two, yeah. yeah. And I think, so, yeah, so I should even, but this is maybe only for 32 byte Arch platform. For 64, we have increased that, or oh, I don't remember, yeah, we have added uh, 10 more bits. Yeah. We have this scale load down and scale load up uh, function. <coughs> so that's also an interesting thing that you have to keep in mind. So the fairness, the 10 percent of running time that you will have, it's just at macroscopic level. It's, um, so I have put three different examples. So you have only one level of priority difference between that. And you can see that the scheduling behavior is quite different. So if you use the default value, nice zero and nice one, you will have, so this is the number of tick that the task will run. So in this case, you will see that the task with the priority zero will run four, following, uh, four consecutive tick, then the other one will run three tick, then four. It's not uh, per tick. But if you are increasing your priority, you can see that you are sp uh, switching much more often. And the main reason, uh, yeah, I'm going there. And the main reason is that we are using what we call a sketch period and a sketch slice. That just gives you the amount of time you should provide. So a sketch period is the amount of time in which you want to schedule all the tasks. And we are computing that by, so I don't know why it's this value, but typically it's six milliseconds multiplied by one plus uh, log two the, uh, of the number of CPUs. So for the high key on which I have run that, which it means that the sketch period is 24 millis milliseconds. Log log? No, log, um, log no, it's the log. Which means that you want to schedule all your, ta all your waiting tasks or runnable tasks in 24 milliseconds. And then the sketch slice is the period for each task. So the sum of the sketch slice should be uh, 24, which means that um, <coughs> typically a task with a priority of, so if you have two tasks with the same priority. You will have 12 uh, milliseconds for each task. So if you go back there, it's not working anymore. So we have a bit more because we don't have exactly the same nice, nice value. So we have 16 milliseconds for one, 12 for the other one, 16, 12, 16, 12. And from time to time, you can see that there is some um, so we are re readjusting because it's only about, uh, we only have some by a period of four milliseconds. And when you're increasing your niceness, you can see that we, sw we are switching much more often, mainly because we are using the very run time to know when we have to change. So with the nice zero, because your run time and your very run time is equal, so you will run the 12 milliseconds, but for higher value of the priority, because your VRN time will, run, will increase much faster, you will reach this 12 milliseconds faster. So after one period, you, already, you have already reached the 12 milliseconds. So the scheduler decides to change for another task. So that's the main reason. And that can have, can have a big impact, because <clears throat> if you look at that, um, so yeah, because this, for example, the skate period there is 24 milliseconds. On mobile phone, we have the 16 millisecond frame period, which means that if you have two tasks running on your CPU and you are unlucky, you can wait up to 12 milliseconds before running. So which means that typically you can have only four milliseconds to run to finish before the end of the frame. So, you can either change your niceness or you can also 
So um, this value, the skate period and the skate slide, you can set that by CCFS. We have default value, but uh, this can be changed at runtime. <coughs> Sorry? Oh, it's uh, on mobile phone. Uh, the, the screen update is oh. 60 frames per second, so it's, it's uh, yes, yeah, 60 fr uh, frames per second, so 16 milliseconds. But you can see that compared to waiting 12 milliseconds before running, if you are the one that have to update the frame, that can be a problem. Yeah, on the I key, because you have a C, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you have two tasks, it's, yeah, the, the, yeah. The skate period is 24 milliseconds. Okay. So by default, we try to stay in this 24 milliseconds. And then when you start to have a lot of tasks, uh, let's say that you have uh, 24 tasks. Oh, I, I think that should uh, still work. Let's say that you have 30, uh, 64 tasks. Yeah. You can't divide the 24 milliseconds by 64. It means that you have almost nothing, 300 microseconds to run. So we will spend more time switching than running something. So in this case, you are increasing the skate period to uh, ensure that each task will have a minimum running time. How much is that? The minimum, uh, it's configurable, and it's more than a millisecond, I think, by default. Uh, can we configure the minimum slice for a particular task? Uh, not for a particular task. Or maybe yeah, you can configure. The skate period, you can configure the minimum slice granularity. You can configure a lot of things. The wake up granularity as well. The, what we call the migration cost. There is a lot of parameter mm -hmm. that uh, almost nobody play with, whereas it have a big impact. Uh. <coughs> so yeah, the last point is that the VRUN time, it's local to a CPU. It's not one value for all the CPU. And uh, <coughs> the main reason is that, so, and then we have to normalize the ta the, this V run time. So either when the task sleep, sleep or when the task migrate. It's just mainly because when you are idle, your V run time is not, your execution time and the v run, no V run time will increase. So you can have, it's not moving at the same pace on all the CPU. So we, and also when you're sleeping. So we are norm normalizing that when the task sleep so that when it will wake up, it will not steal all the running time because we, are, we try to schedule the task with the lowest V run time, which means that the one that, that received the lowest running time. <coughs> and also between CPU, just to make sure that if you migrate to a CPU which have run much more tasks since the beginning, you will not steal all the running time compared to the, uh, the other task. So we normalize when the task wakes up, wake up, right? Yeah. Not by the sleep. Uh, so in fact, when a task sleep, you normalize. And when a task wake up, you go back to the CPU you did denormalize. Normalize it's when you are at a value that <coughs> you can easily migrate. You don't take into account the current mean variant time of the CPU. Normalize is that. You have removed the current mean run time of the CPU. So you are normalized each time you are out of a run queue, out of a runnable queue, sorry. And this is, so it's not realistic mainly because of normalized, but if we took this example, let's say that we have two tasks with the same nice priority. <coughs> they have the same uh, load, so they are running almost, uh, I put uh, 50, 25 percent of the time. So they are running 25 percent of the time, they have the same priority. So they should get the same amount of running time. There is no reason that one task is running more than the other one. But because the period is not the same, without the normalization, <coughs> so task B is sleeping one and a half second, and during this, task E will increase in its run time because it will wake up and continue to run. And then when task B will wake up to run is uh, 25, uh, this 500 milliseconds, because his V run time is something like 400 milliseconds less, 
It means that he could run more than al almost half a second in one shot, preventing the other one to run. So it's not fair. So that's why we are normalizing when sleeping. It's just to not accumulate some uh, unlimited uh, running time during when you are sleeping. <clears throat> then the, the real time, so at wake up. So when you have a new task and you pl place this task on a run queue, you will num uh, the V runtime of this task will be set after the current skate slice. So you have a skate period and the task, some tasks have been provisioned to run. And a new task, you put is the runtime to be to start to run after the current skate slice, this current skate period. <clears throat> Whereas for the when the task wake up and it's not a, a new task. So um, we just look at, we try to make um, a trade-off between a, uh, a sleep duration and the fact that it can preempt the current running task if you had sleep too much time. So that's the value. The goal is normally a task sh uh, that wake up, it will have, a, uh, we are removing one skate slice to the current minimum the runtime of the CPU, but we are ensuring to not uh, moving back is the runtime as well. So it's just placing that in the running time. We are just placing the task in the running time. So with the first line, when you said a new task comes, we uh, place it just after the, the no, no, the first line only. So for if, if we take this example, let's say that we are there just we have the skit, uh, we have this skit period there. We wake up there, uh, a new task wake up at that time. We will place is the, the runtime to start there. To say that when all, uh, when these two tasks will have run the skit slice, we will start to add this sub task at that moment. So a new task which gets added will only be able to run after all the tasks that were there will run once at least. Yeah. But is that, isn't that unfair also? Because if there are 10 tasks already there on a CPU, then the new task will get a chance to run only after the complete period actually. So, so it's maybe the you 20, wanted to say 24 millisecond period. It has to wait 24 milliseconds. Yeah. So when you, so can you go to the previous slide? Previous or? The last slide you were oh. showing. So in the first line when you said that the new task starts after the current sked slice, it's shouldn't sked you write period. sked period? Yes, sked right. period. Um, yeah. no, no, I'm not going on the right. Yeah. Do you have question on the runtime before moving on capacity? I will run out of time. No. When a task wake up, it will not wait for the current sketch slice. It will will try to make it a bit before the other one to preempt. But uh, I mean, if you have, for example, if a task has uh, slept only one millisecond, will not remove. A, so it's the, the it's based on the sketch slice. So it's not the full sketch period when you wake up. It's based on your priority. So, <clears throat> for example, if you slept one millisecond, you will not have a twelve millisecond credit. You will stay at your millisecond. But if you slept um, one second, mm -hmm. we will give you a full skate slice of credit because it means that the other tasks have a lot of time to run before. So you, you will just be inserted in the current uh, skate period. But if it was one millisecond, you have to wait till the next yeah, period? Yeah, we take the, the maximum between removing 12 milliseconds and your current uh, value. So just that to just because running, uh, sleeping one millisecond, it just, uh, you just have to wait compared to the one, to the other one. It's uh, that you, you, would have wait, you would have waited for this millisecond even if you were not sleeping. That, that the point is that compared to not sleeping or running, should you have waited more or not? You yeah. can even pre preempt the current task. Okay. 
except that uh, we ensure a minimum of running time for the current task. So if that is over, you can... Yeah, yeah. If, if yeah. your real runtime is less than... Yeah, the, exactly. The yeah. The CPU capacity, so that's another metric that just reflect the compute capacity of a CPU. So the default value is this, this power of two value. And the architecture can override that. So that's what we are using for big little system. <laughs> we are using, uh, we are estimating the, the ratio between each CPU and we are setting that. <coughs> So uh, which platform don't use the capacity? So as I explained, big little mm -hmm. platform, but also during hyper for when you have hyper threading and CPU sharing a core, just because having two CPU doesn't mean that you have two core. And usually the estimation is that uh, if you have two CPU in the same core, so you have a SMT2, uh, you are gaining something like 25%, which means that the sum of capacity of the CPU of the core is 25 more than a core with only one CPU. So that's the thing. So two CPU is different from two core and one core with hyper threading is, has more compute capacity than one core without. Maybe because you have two, pi two execution pipe, but you have to wait from time to time to when you want to use the ALU and so on. So at the end, the estimation is that it gives you 25% more computation time. So are they also using different capacities? Like the, the ASIM capacities is used there also for SMT? The ASIM capacity flag? Uh, SM capacity? Ah, uh, the, yeah. The, uh, no, 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 it's not used the there. The asymmetric capacity. No, that's another feature that is used. Uh, so for big little, it's obvious. And it's also used on, Intel, on some Intel platform, on some recent Intel platform, even if they have some SMP system, so normally it's the same core with the same compute capacity, because of the process, they know that some CPU can reach higher turbo frequency than the other one. So in a, in a core, you have some CPU which are much more powerful than the other one. But it's just when it's alone and it's just uh, in some case. So in average, it has the, the same compute capacity, but you can have some boost of capacity. And they are using that to say that at this level, this, we have some CPU with more um, um, <coughs> temporary uh, compute capacity. So use this one in priority to get as much capa compute capacity as possible. There can also be case if maybe for Intel with SMT, there are two cores, one has two threads and one has four threads. I don't know if it is physically possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, typically, yeah. <coughs> but if that is the case, then they are actually yeah. having asymmetric capacity yeah. straight away. Um, that. So one question here. Yeah. So is the CPU capacity used to calculate the VRUN time, uh, basically? Uh, yeah. Not for the VRUN time. Mm -hmm. It's used, uh, no, it's not used for the VRUN time. But it's used to balance the task between a uh, CPU, which means that a CPU, um, Let's say that you have two core. One is twice more uh, powerful than the other one, and you have 10 tasks, or let's say 12 tasks. That will be easier. You, uh, you will put, during the load balance, we'll put eight tasks on the big core and only four tasks on the little core. So at the end, even if the VRUN time is not scaled, they will have the same amount because you, you will have to share. You will have to wait more time. But even then, I think, <coughs> even if it doesn't have a direct uh, effect on the VRUN time, it will still have a direct effect because uh, suppose we have two tasks, one ends up on a little CPU, one ends up on a big CPU. Yeah. The one on a big CPU will have a higher VRUN time than the lower one because it will run on the CPU which can go to a higher frequency or yeah. a higher capacity. Yeah. So eventually the VRUN time of a task on a big CPU will increase at a faster rate compared to the little one. No, because it's absolute runtime. In this case, we are unfair because the one on the big will get more runtime. But I thought we started to, we have had the patch which makes V runtime depend on the frequency. No, not oh, We haven't done time. that yet? No. Oh, okay. Then it, it is. 
No, no. So it's, it's on the task level, so you basically schedule yeah. more tasks on the exactly. CPU. Exactly, yeah, that's wh how we are, yeah. Yeah, otherwise uh, there is, I mean, let's say that we have only two tasks, one big core, one little core. Mm -hmm. Unless you are from time to time switching the two mm -hmm. tasks, that could be possible. That, no, that doesn't happen in this case, but yeah. That may be something that could be done. But this thing is in plans to make read on time depend on the CPU frequency, right? Um, that should not be a big deal, but that means that we should uh, um, uh, change a lot of things in the load balance. Okay, because right away it's very, very unfair if a task run on which CPU already. Yeah, but uh, what can we do? There is no other choice. I mean, unless you are switching tasks from time to time. Yeah. It's not a CPU yeah, but that, I mean, uh, that can be a way to scale the... It's more like one kid uh, is yeah. one on, on a rich person's house and one on the poor person's house. How can you make them fair? <laughs> you have to make them fair, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, 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 is fair when you don't well, consider the frequency? I don't... Uh, is there... I, it is fair. Do you know if there is another session after mine? Uh, I think so. so because I'm... Is up to four on it today. There is? <laughs> so we have uh, two minutes to finish. <laughs> yeah, we will not be able, but at no least we'll finish the, all the metric. No more questions. The, <laughs> the parent TT load tracking, so this is the sun metric. The goal is to monitor the activity of each task and each entity. <coughs> so the goal is to track the utilization, the load, and the runnable load. Run, uh, this is for run queue and task. For all the run queue, CFS RT deadline for all the CFS tasks. And we are also tracking the amount of time in interrupt context. Um, the runnable load, it's only for run queue and it just show you the, the sum of tasks that are runnable compared to all the tasks put on a, uh, on a CPU. So it's just some, uh, it's a geometric series with a half period of 32 milliseconds. So that just gives you the, how the, the signal is evolving. So it's starting ramping fast and then uh, tend to stabilize. Um, so we are migrating the utilization between run queue. So this is the example where this, where we, um, so this is the utilization of two CPU. We have a task that is running on one CPU, and then in the middle, the task migrate on another CPU, and the utilization migrate as well. So you always know exactly what is the run, the utilization on each CPU, even if tasks are migrating. So you have instantaneous <coughs> value for that. Um, <coughs> UTLS, it's an add-on on the load tracking. The goal is to track the last max utilization so it's still the same case there. So it just gives you that uh, for this, the task, because it's uh, when you're sleeping, your utilization is slowly decayed, and then it's ramping up and, and decaying, which means that when you wake up, your utilization is the lowest value that you will have. So when you, if you want to scale the frequency, you might scale down the frequency of the CPU because you, say, you, you think that the utilization is low and then this will increase. So that's why we are monitoring the last max value. So you can directly start at what should be your utilization at the end. So yeah, the goal is to minimize the number of frequency switch. We are invariant. The utilization is invariant across CPU, frequency, and architecture. So wherever the task is running, its utilization will be exactly the same. So that when you migrate, you will not have a change Otherwise, I mean, if your load is A on a CPU and you want to migrate to balance, but when you move on the other CPU to become B, you might be unbalanced. So you will migrate somewhere else. Then you will have a new value and you will non-ending just uh, migrating your task. You have some invariance also in deadline. So across micro architecture and frequency, deadline scheduler. So it's used to set the deadline bandwidth. So the deadline scheduler for each task, you set the runtime and the period, so you know how many bandwidth, CPU bandwidth you need. And based on that, you can set the frequency of your CPU based on the task on your 
RenQ. And I think I will have to stop because the other CPU. So I'll, uh, I have a few other things to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should have took two, two, two hours. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that will be for the next connect. Thank you. Sorry?